All right, all right. Hello and welcome to another episode of A Fresh Perspective with Jeff Charles, with your boy, your favorite conservatarian contrarian, Jeff Charles, where we prefer truth over narrative and principles over politics. And I've got another great interview for you. Uh, I got somebody who does what I do. So this will be an, a very interesting conversation. Um, but before I get, in, get, get into everything, make sure that you like this video, share this video. And if you haven't already subscribed, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. That way you'll be notified whenever I upload a new interview, which I am doing twice a week, every Wednesday evening, every Wednesday and Friday evening at seven o'clock Eastern Standard. So also remember that LibertyNation.com is a proud sponsor of A Fresh Perspective. Check out LibertyNation.com for all of your conservatarian news, original articles and analysis, uh, videos, podcasts, Liberty Nation Radio, and their signature TV program, The Conservative Five, all on LibertyNation.com, where truth is making a comeback. Now, without further ado, I want to welcome contributor for Fearless with Jason Whitlock and a con contributor for The Blaze, Mr. Delano Squires. What's going on, brother? Thank you for having me. Good, good. It, it, it's This will be very interesting for me because, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, you and I do basically the same thing. I mean, we're both writers, we're both mm -hmm. commentators, mm -hmm. we're both black conservatives, all that stuff. So this, I think we're going we're gonna to have a really good conversation. And the cool thing about us is that we disagree a lot and, it, and, it, and it's cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, but first, before I mean, this, there's a few things that that we're going to want to talk about. But why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, who who are you? What, what, how'd you get into this game? Sure, um, that's a good question. So I, I've been writing publicly for about ten years. Uh, okay. I started writing for a site called Black and Married with Kids. Uh, it was started by a couple who wanted to provide more positive images of you know black families and marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they started this, you know, they had started before I even came to it. Uh, when I came to the site, I was the only single writer. So okay. I'll write relationship articles you know, from, a, from a singles perspective. And then um, funny enough, the, the couple also did documentaries and I met my wife at their third documentary. Nice. So um, they helped me add the married with kids part to, to the just being black part. So mm -hmm. So I started writing for BMWK. Um, after that, I wrote for The Root, um, probably about four or five pieces, including one on Black conservatives um, and how they outreach to Black voters. This was 2016. And so I wrote for The Root, The Griot. Then I had my own blog for a period of time called Truth No Chaser. And once I decommissioned that, I, I still had the itch to write. So I started to write for The Federalist. Okay. And then... Um, I joined up with the Blaze, so I think I'm the only person I feel comfortable saying this. Okay, who can say they've written for the Root, the Griot, yeah. the Federalists, the Blaze, and have been edited by both Joy Reid and Jason Whitlock? Wow, wow, yeah, that, that's true. Nobody else can say that. I mean, I, I do know a guy who wrote for the Root, and then mm -hmm. he wrote for Red State a little bit too. But uh, other than that, I know. So, so why, well, yeah, so I want to talk about that actually before mm -hmm. we get into anything else. How, how was the dynamic writing for both The Root and The Griot as a black conservative? So, so the one thing I'll say is I, I never labeled myself as a black conservative, definitely not when I was writing for The Root. Okay. Right. So, it's one of these things, and I know, Jeff, you, you, you probably experienced this in the work that you do. There are a lot of black folk who have conservative values. Sure but don't identify as black conservatives and or um, reliably vote for Democrats. Yes. Um, that, that disconnect, I think, is a very interesting, you know, political issue to, to study um, because the Democrats basically have, you know, a, a wing of black socially conservative voters mm -hmm. who vote for them, but disagree with much of, you know, sort of the Democrats, particularly their, their policies and values today. Um, it would also, it would all, almost be similar that, it would be similar to if the Republicans had an Antifa wing, right? Where it's like people who vote reliably right. Republican are against gun control, are pro-abortion, are for big government welfare spending, so on and so on and so forth, but they still vote Republican. So, 
So that being said, mm -hmm. when I wrote for the root, um, I still would you know, write some of the same stuff I write now in terms of the importance of you know family. I would tackle race issues. I think one of the pieces I had was called Lessons from My Father. So I did that around Father's Day. Um, okay. One was on black Republicans and the, all of the language about leaving the Democrat plantation. So I, I wrote that again. This was 2016. At that point, the it girl was not Candace Owens. It was Crystal Wright, who I'm sure you right, remember, right. GOP black chick. And she came on Fox and Friends. Yeah, I, just, I actually just found out. I just found out what Struggle Chicken was. <laughs> but I right, 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 right. I, I remember that. That was before Paula Patton. But um, so she she came on Fox and Friends the, on February first, I think, like 2016, first day of Black History Month, and said Black voters um, are the dumbest voters politically. I'm paraphrasing, but this was the gist of it. And they need to yeah. get off the Democrat plantation and so on and so on and so forth. And the hosts were eating it up. And I just, I just felt like this is if you wanna if you wanna reach people, this is not the way to do it. You don't do it by personally insulting them. Um, so uh, it was the the route was cool. I would pitch pieces. Some of them they, they took, some they didn't. And then I noticed a shift. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is around the time they got purchased by Univision, but. Um, they were no longer, at least in my view, open to a sort of centrist, moderate, slightly center-right perspective. Mm -hmm. I think they were, they started to move further and further and further to the left. So it's one of these things where, politically speaking, you could be a person um, who has always identified as, you know, centrist, moderate, moderate Republican, moderate Democrat. Mm -hmm have not moved an inch on any of your core positions and now find yourself being described as a conservative because you know the 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 left the democratic party has just moved that far to the left so yes yeah um so yeah so at the time it was cool you know i had good relationships with the editors and stuff like that and and i think my content generally fit within the site i mean i'm sure you remember the route when it first started they had stuff by michael michael Steele, skip gates john mcwater um, mm -hmm. They would publish a range of different political opinions and had commentary and like substantive meaty, you know, columns and op-eds. Now it was just a lot of fluff, um, you know, hate whitey type stuff, which I have no interest in. So um, yeah. I don't read it that often, but the things that I do see, rarely am I impressed. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's gone a long way from, uh, from its roots, for lack of a better term. Right. I mean, right. It it's kind of disappointing, but I think, you know, I think that that's what happens. I mean, you get that pressure to be as left wing as possible. I mean, I, mm -hmm. that, you know, Jamil Jamani. I mean, you know what mm -hmm. happened with him, right? Yep. Yeah. So, yep. I mean, it's the same thing even up in Canada. So it's it's a real shame because it does put forth the appearance that black people are a monolith and that we all think right. the same. Even even black Democrats don't all think the same. But so it's it's it's, it's a shame that they weren't really willing to to have more diverse viewpoints. Uh, now, did you see the same thing with the Grio, or how was that? Or how was that in, in comparison? Um, I, I may have written only maybe one or two pieces for the Grio. Um, okay. I, I did a little bit more writing on that side, and even that, this wasn't much, but I did a little bit more with the root. But it was it's the same it's the same shift. I think they have roughly followed one another leftward, and part of it, honestly, is I think the supply has. Um, has tailored itself to the demand, and, and this is what a lot of, you know, a lot of people, to me, unfortunately, like is the 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 potty mouth, the sassy, Real Housewives of Atlanta style mm -hmm. gossip mm -hmm. stuff. The, as I said, like, like the the root, and, and this is one of my frustrations. The root was a site, both of them sites that were created to to appeal to black readers, right? Mm -hmm. I remember doing research on an article, and at that time, a couple of years ago, the root had a tag called "white people," and that thing had, I think, over a hundred plus articles. One of them from a guy named Michael Harry, who since left yeah. the root and now is with the Grio, was about the five types of Becky. Now he also had one on the six types of Karen. So, again, to me, it is does it fill a need in the market? Yes. Is it edifying? Right? Is it informative? Is it helpful? No. Is it thought provoking? So, <laughs> right. No, de definitely not. It, I mean, it's funny. It's, I will admit, like when I read some of Michael Harriet's stuff, I do laugh. But I mean, but you're right. Yeah. I mean, 
lot of substance there. Not that he doesn't have substance, because I've seen some of the correct. Things I, I, but I would say he, he, I would say he has he has substance. I, I yeah. disagree with him a lot, but he has substance. So so to me, that type of stuff is just is low hanging fruit, and and I don't see it as you know contributing again to that rich um, political discourse that has been you know a part of black culture. I mean pre-emancipation like I, I just i just i was traveling through um actually florida the other day and an airport in tallahassee they had um it was a wall full of quotes from a bunch of different black leaders in the 19th century 1800s mm-hmm. and they were answering different questions you know like what role will education have in the uplift of the negro and um what role should Christianity have in public life for the Negro, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, one, I thought it was a great uh, exhibit. So shout out to FAMU, Florida A and M University. Mm-hmm. But two, I got home and I bought the book. My wife ordered it for me on Amazon. It's four hundred fifty pages, mm-hmm. and I was immediately struck by how substantive and thoughtful. Now these are people who many of them were either enslaved themselves or had parents who were enslaved. Mm. And their writing was so much more impressive than what we get today. I'm, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm saying apples to apples comparison, elite to elite, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I read the stuff that goes up in the nation, in the Atlantic, in the New York Times, mm-hmm. in general, but, but I'm again, elites to elites for, for the black folk who write for those places. If you strip out the euphemisms and cliches, you may get three paragraphs. May mm. on a good day. Mm. It's, it's trash, you know what I mean. And I, and I and I'm mm. I'm not trying to hold myself up or anything, but it's not. It's you, Jeff. When you read it, you you know what you're looking for. Okay, yeah. and it's okay. Five, four, three, two, one. And homophobia, transphobia, racism, yeah. sexism. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, why why would I read five this? sentences in? That's where Correct. it starts. Correct. And and these are people who can't grapple with the. The, the, the deeper things, the, like m- morality, right? The, the, the cosmos, they can't grapple with any of this stuff. And the folks who, again, just came up out of the fields are writing, I mean, the prose is, is beautiful. And I, mm-hmm. I was, and all of them weren't college educated, right? All of them, people would probably say, oh, these are probably all the folks who was in the house. All of them didn't appear to be Creoles and mixed race. Yeah. But it's just, their thought processes were just so much more advanced than what we have now because our culture, um, American culture in general, and American political discourse, and particularly in the Black community, I just think has been dumbed down. And part of that is because there we don't allow for that natural um, process of iron sharpening iron, and that's mm-hmm. why the left's arguments feel so flabby. And this is why people like Ibram Kendi do not engage in public debate. He will right. only talk to friendlies. Yep. Because if he yep. had to. He would have to explain how the king of anti-racism, the person who says that any policy that produces disparate outcomes between different racial groups is racist, how he would then defend cities like you know New York um, implementing vaccine passports that disproportionately have an impact on, on black yep. folks. Yep. He would have to answer for that, but he doesn't want to answer for that, so he just talks to, to friendlies all day long. So, um, so yeah, I, I think if we had more open, robust, vigorous debate, I think our, you know, the, our community and the country would be better for it. But um, a lot of people don't want that because I think their ideas would be exposed. And once their ideas are exposed, then, you know, the, the cash reserves start to dry up. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think a lot of their ideas or positions can be hard to defend, um, which is why you don't see, like, you'll see conservatives go on their stuff, mm-hmm. but you don't see a lot of leftists or progressives mm-hmm. who will come on conservative media. There's some, there are right. some, they do exist, but in general, we don't really see that. And, right. I, I, and I, I'm not even, I, I shouldn't even specifically apply this to black people, just progressives in general. I don't care right. what it is. It doesn't happen that much, but it's it, it is almost like they uphold their their echo chambers because it's easier that way. I mean, that's mm-hmm. why they create that term safe space. Right. To to say what you want and not be challenged on it. Mm. It's it's scary that that's kind of where some of these people want to lead us. I mean, we're not all going to go because you're still going to have conservatives who want their ideas challenged. 
and it, without having it be just a, a pissing contest for lack of a better word right but i just i, I think it's it, it's dangerous and you can kind of see and you can see because when they are in the position where they have to actually defend their ideas a lot of them fall apart <laughs> there are some who are formidable mm -hmm. um, but uh, others they, they they fall apart you just, just you just just start asking questions mm -hmm. And that's all you have to do in, in, in most cases. I and mean, then they, they don't know what to do. Which, which is, that's, that's, my, that's my calling card, right? That's what I use Twitter for most times. Yeah. One, one well-placed question right on the chin mm -hmm. makes most of them fold up. There's some questions when I, I, as I'm writing it, I say to myself, I know there's no way this person is going to answer it. Not, not truthfully. Right, like, right. They, they will, they'll dip, they'll dodge, they'll yep. dance, they'll deflect. Yep. But they won't come out just straight up and, and answer the question. So yeah, I've seen you do that. I've seen you do that, and I like it because I do that too. So when I see you doing doing it, I'm like, yeah, I I know exactly how this is going to go. They're oh, not yeah. going to give him an answer. Right. <laughs> and, and and that's one of the things for me as a as a writer, um, because because for me the, the the writing is secondary to the thinking. So before right. I put pen to paper, I've like thoroughly gone through a particular idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't write anything that I can't defend because right. I, I believe, just in a practical level and, and even on a spiritual level, I'm responsible for every single word that I say and write. Yes. So if I'm, if I'm articulating an idea, I got to be able to stand 10 toes down, firmly planted, to defend it with clear, um, precise, understandable language from a forward position. Not, well, I, I disagree with Jeff's position. I won't say what my position is. I'll just say, well, some people who I don't like have Jeff's position. So, so it's like you instead of instead of hitting the front door with a battering ram, you run around the side window and try to break in or try to or try to jimmy the back door open. I don't like that. Straight mm -hmm. through the front door. And if I can't defend it again from from that type of position, then I just I won't say it. Or I'll just wait until you know the idea has been more fully cooked and, right. and incubated. But uh, that, that's a lot of what you get on on the left, and, and every once in a while on the right. I mean, there's some people who I engage with, who I mean, I I, I kind of get you know the, the the dance that they're that they're trying to um you know engage in. But for, for me, that's that's how I keep myself honest, and that's one of the reasons why I never want to write under a pseudonym, because I'm just like mm -hmm. I want to be able to write things that I honestly believe in a tone and a and a fact and stand by it, so that if I ever run into somebody. In, in real life, I'm not going to say, well, I didn't really mean that. No, I mean, you know, I, I meant it. We can we can disagree on it. But um, I never write things that I that I can't back up, you know, with, with my own words. So how do you uh, so let me ask you this, mm -hmm. you know, you know, one writer to another, mm -hmm. um, because. With me, there's always I think a lot of us have this temptation to kind of say what people want to hear. And, mm -hmm. and I and realistically, I probably clash more with the right than you do, at least from what I've seen. Okay. But even then, even if you are saying, you know, what they agree with, how do you find the balance between writing something that, in a way that makes people want to read it, but not going full clickbait where you have no substance? That's a great question. So, yeah. so for me, as I said, the, 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 the writing comes secondary to the thinking. Mm -hmm. And the thinking, my thinking, I have to um, submit to, to my standard, you know, in terms of how I view the world. So, so my worldview, right? So people who follow me know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I write about faith a lot and mm -hmm. not just faith in terms of I go to church and I help old ladies cross the street. But right. no, I, I, I try to apply a biblical framework to all manner of life, to to finance and relationship and politics and, you know, culture, social custom. So as I'm thinking about my particular ideas, I have those in, in, in my left hand and I'm thinking about you know, whether the specific biblical principles that apply to whatever issue it is. Mm -hmm. And I have those in my right hand. And my first job is to never confuse What's the ruler or what's the crooked stick? And once I get that straight, then I can say, okay, what is it that I actually believe? Right. And the good thing about having done this, you know, for a, a period of time and 
you know, working out a lot of ideas with friends and family is that there are people who know me who know what I actually believe. So they'll know when I'm lying about something. <laughs> First among them is my wife, <laughs> right? So if I'm on TV, if I'm on Tucker Carlson, yeah. I start talking some nonsense. When I come home, she'll be like, what, what are you talking about? I know you don't believe that. So I, I try never to get in that in that space. But um, so I, I just I write the things that I that I believe are true. And I try to if I'm if I'm making a falsifiable claim, something that can easily be checked, I double check to make sure that, that I have the evidence to support whatever the claim is. And the heavier the claim, the more evidence I bring to bear. If Definitely. I'm just articulating an opinion on something, then I still try to substantiate that with something other than just what my imagination told me. Um, yeah. And, and I try to connect the dots, um, write in a way that's accessible, but I don't condescend to people. So I don't say, oh, well, if they're on this platform, they won't know this word. So I write in a way that's natural to me and, and oftentimes the way I, right. I would say something. And then from there, I let the chips fall with me. So I've, I've written things that um, probably have offended, you know, Trump voters. I've, I've written mm-hmm. things that I'm, I'm sure, you know, other black conservatives disagree with. Like when, when you and I, you know, we went back and forth a couple of times on the, yeah. the nature and impact of, of hip hop and particularly gangster rap on the right, broader right. black culture. And I had some people respond to me, well, just just say you don't mess with us, for lack of a better term. Just say you don't mess with us and leave us alone. I was like, well, that's not yeah. That's not that's not the case. You know, yeah. so um so yeah, so I, I don't I don't I never consider well who's going to agree with this and who's not going to agree with this. Mm-hmm. The first thing mm-hmm. I ask myself is do I believe what I'm writing and is it true? And if I can do that, I'll sleep like a baby at night. Um, so I had, a, I had a piece the other day about reparations. I know it's a hot topic on the right. Yeah. Um, and I know someone like, like me whose family came here in the late seventies, early eighties. A lot of people say, well, you shouldn't even have an opinion, but I pay taxes. I got kids. <laughs> right. Wait, wait, wait. So, so if you were to come out against police brutality, would they right. say that you shouldn't have an opinion because you're not a cop? That's, right. That, that, right. That is the dumbest argument for anything that I've it ever is. heard. It is. But but to, to be fair, I'm cognizant of it. So in that yeah. sense, um, I'm not going to change my opinions. But I think as a communicator, one of my jobs is to do my best to ensure that the ideas I'm trying to articulate um, reach the people that I actually want to reach. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I think about those things. But ultimately, again, I got a rule in one hand. I got a crooked stick in the next. And, and when those two things clash, I know which one I have to have to let go of. Yeah. I think that that's a good policy. That, that that's a good principle to follow. I mean, for me, it's it is it is kind of similar for me too. I mean, but it's like with me, it's like and, you know, if I want to, I could just tell everybody what they want to hear. I mean, that that's right. the easy route. Right. But could I live with myself? Mm. No. It, it is honestly, it was it is easier for me to write what I feel and get all kinds of crap, whether it's from the left or the right, mm-hmm. and know that I said what I need to say. If I then I would feel worse if I just fed them what they want and that's right. it because right. I'm like you know I'm not really helping anything here I mean right. anybody can do this so but and, and, and sometimes I, I'll throw all the red meat because I actually believe the red meat so mm-hmm. that, that in that way I'm not I'm not um, compromising myself right but I do feel like I have to put the truth out there as I see it and I think people I think most people appreciate that mm. they won't always say it I mean because most of the people who are going to like say uh, slide into your DMs or send you an email. A lot of them just want to complain, <laughs> but you'll get the ones who say, "You know what? I, I didn't think of it the way you just said it." That's mm. very interesting. So I know that if they're actually saying it, that there are more people who are Believe taking it. it in a way that's positive too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. But, but I, I think the point you raise about compromise and being able to live with yourself are so important, right? So for me, like those are like foundational principles. Yeah, I can't put a price tag on on my on my dignity and self respect, and it's one of the more frustrating things, particularly now that I'm identified as a as a black conservative, which I'm completely fine with. Mm-hmm. Is that people um, on the left and sometimes on the right will assume well you're just saying things because you write for the blaze or because yeah. you're a grifter. Now, well, those are more lazy arguments, though. Correct. I, mean, I can't take those people seriously when correct. they do. Correct. So instead of 
because whenever I write something, I mean, I'm making a, a series of substantive arguments. And a person can latch on to any one of them and say, you said this, I disagree with this because of this reason. That's okay. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, would, I would enjoy that repartee, but I never get that. It's always all, you're grifting, you should be ashamed. There's one guy who, I'm not even going to mention his handle, but he, every time I write something, he, he's in the comments. And he, he'll come with the little memes or whatever. And I just, there's, there's never any substance. So, um, as I said, for me, and I think you're saying the same thing, the ability to live with yourself is incredibly important. Yeah. And if you can go to bed knowing that I said what I believe, I backed up any claim that I made, um, and I'm staying true to myself, like that's a that's a good day. Yeah. Good. Good. So, what? And you actually brought this up when we were talking before. You wanted to, we wanted to talk about the role of electoral politics in transforming Black communities. Mm-hmm. And you know, as conservatives, I mean, we don't want the government too involved, right? So what, do, I mean, and I, I wrestle with this all the time because we talk about the issues black people face. And I, I know that a lot of that involves getting the government out of the way and all this good mm-hmm. stuff. But what do you think the role of electoral politics should be when it comes to fixing a lot of issues that black Americans face? It's a great question. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to give part of my response is going to be on substance and part of my response is going to be on framing, right? Mm-hmm. One, I think the use of the term fix or solve mm. is, you know, those terms are used way too much when we're talking about the role electoral politics has in, you know, community transformation, social change, so on and so on and so forth. And that's, and that's, that's with any community, however you define it, right? Sure. Because I, I think w- one of the things that I think should be hammered home more often from both the left and right, black and white, as it relates to race issues, is that black people are people first. All of the virtues, all of the vices, good, bad, and ugly, mm-hmm common humanity. And again, I, I say this as a, as a, as a Christian, so I don't, I don't attribute vice nor virtue to any race or ethnicity. So I only say that, and it, it sounds self-evident, and it should be, but I only say that because for a lot of our you know, race discourse, again, from the left or the right, white people are positioned as having personal agency. So when a white person commits a crime, it's because he may have been evil. He may have had mental health issues. Right. He may have right. privilege. He raised you know, wrong, or you know, yeah. But when a black person commits a crime, the natural instinct is to go to systemic fact- factors, structural mm-hmm. forces. So in that way, we are stripped of agency, and that may seem empowering to some people because that is then used by other people to advocate for more government involvement. In our personal lives. But to me, it's the most disempowering thing you can do to any person. Because the one, um, there are a lot of things that separate men from boys. But one of the primary things that separates a man from from a child is his ability to take responsibility for himself and other people. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, you're toast. So somebody may hear me and say, oh, he talking about pulling himself up by his bootstraps. I'll say this, I'd rather pull myself up by my bootstraps than to be pushed around in somebody's bassinet. So -hmm. there are some people, again, on the left and the right, who advocate um, the black politics that I I would frame them as damsel in distress politics. The black community's here, we're struggling, we're looking for somebody to save us. Yes. I advocate dark night politics, right? So I'm not... If if you're waiting, if if you if you're a black person, you live in Philadelphia, New York, D.C., where Atlanta, New Orleans, wherever, Cleveland, Detroit, and your position is that the 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 homicide victimization rate in your city, which is almost exclusively black, some cities is, is black and Hispanic, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very few white people are getting shot and killed in these cities. Right. That won't change until some white person in uh, you know Montana mouths the words black lives matter and advocates for the federal government to pass some whatever 
some bill that's going to fix fix my community. Yeah. Then to me, you're lost. And, and, and I say that with all due respect. So, so again, part of it is framing. Part of it is, is substance. Um, the substance is, uh, I, I see a lot on the right around small business investment. I think that's a great idea. Yep. Um, education funding. I, th- I think in theory it's a good idea, but I mean, in most big cities, ed- the schools are being funded. Yeah, the you, wazoo. we see how that turns out. Yeah. Correct. Um, I, uh, school choice is big, certainly on on on, on the right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do see among a subset of the right, you know, calls for for reparations and and direct. Um, I would, for the sake of argument, d- direct cash payments to the descendants of of uh, the enslaved, descendants of freedmen. Mm-hmm. Um, some things around housing, making cities more affordable, so on and so on and so forth. I, th- I don't think any of those things in and of themselves are bad policies. Obviously, they all require specificity. But, and, and this critique typically goes to the left, but I'm going to make it to the right um, for the sake of argument. To me, if you're a Black person talking about politics, culture, social transformation in the Black community, and at no point do you address the issue of marriage and family, and, and I say that specifically, mm-hmm. not not disembodied fatherhood, which is fathers are good, which is which obviously I agree with, right? Right, of course. But if we're talking about, you know, in a in a large scale, if we're still if we still use the language of the left where we where we separate marriage and child rearing, so we take what used to be a buffet, you pay one price that was marriage, and mm-hmm. you get everything that comes with it, lifelong companionship, children, so on and so forth. Let the record show that you just portrayed marriage as a price to pay for something. I mean, I'm I, I'm willing to pay it, right? Cause, nah, cause, I hear you. I feel you. Because to be clear, everybody's going to pay a price of one sort or another. Sure. So, so, so we we move from that to a la carte menu. You can have the kid, but you don't have to be married. You can have a relationship for one for at a, at a, for a period of time for one person. And then that ends. And then you go to another person. And then that ends. So now you have what the social scientists call multiple partner fertility. So mm. a, a mom with three kids by two different fathers. And that father has four children by three different mothers. And so on and so on and so forth. If you think that one bureaucrat, whether in your state capital or the capital of this country, is going to write a piece of legislation that is going to... Um, counteract all of the decisions that you've made in your personal life Mm. that lead to anywhere from you know sort of instability to complete dysfunction then again you you the the bus has left you and 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 that's one of my frustrations with both the black left and right is that we put way too and this is this is this is american critique we sure. put way too much stock and faith in the ability of uh, elected officials and unelected bureaucrats to fix our lives. Mm. Most people can't even stick to the New Year's resolution they made to eat healthy for more than three months. But we think somebody who doesn't know us is going to fix all of the things that either we inherited or that we did um, by the stroke of a pen. And I just I don't see that as realistic. So. So for me, I think electoral politics are important, but I personally, I would, if somebody said, Delano, let's make, let's make a deal. I'll give you control over the culture for 10 years so you can direct it in any way you can, but you lose um, 60% of your voting power, particularly on, on, in terms of federal federal elections. Sure. So, fact, so you don't want to get you won't get to vote for president for 10 years. I take that deal. In a heartbeat. I take that deal. Mm-hmm. I, I would take that deal. But you know, again, in our community it's just it's all politics all the time. And again, it's important and I think certainly and this is why I respect the work that you and a lot of other black conservatives are doing, certainly on the local level, much yeah. more important. Those are the yeah. policies that touch your everyday life. But if you gave me control of the culture, 
and, and gave me the tools to clean that up, I would take that in a heartbeat. Um, so yeah, so I hope I answered your question. As I said, I think it's both a framing issue and a, as a substance issue. Um, but I think, as I said, we put too much stock in, in electoral politics. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't disagree with any of that. And I actually want to go back to something that you were saying. But before I, I go forward with that, just want to remind everybody, don't forget to head on over to LibertyNation.com, a proud sponsor of a fresh perspective. We've got a lot of awesome material on there. You, you can get all of the conservative news and analysis without all the spin and out all, without all the superficial talking points. You'll get in-depth analysis on the issues of the day with all of the nuance and none of the spin. So okay. check out new and original material on LibertyNation.com where truth is making a comeback. So, Delano, I want to go back to what you were saying about the word fix. That stood out to me. And what I'm going to say, I'm talking to myself, too. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop saying, what can the government do to fix this Correct. problem? Because it can't. It can't fix anything. Mm -hmm. The most it can do is to maybe help. And a lot of that help involves getting the hell out of the way. <laughs> Doing less. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Or, or, or making sure that people's rights are protected, things like that. Yeah. But there's not a lot that the government can do that can get involved in where they're actually going to make the situation better. Mm -hmm. And I agree, I would take the culture too before I would take the government. But even when I talk about the culture or the community, I was thinking more like a local politics because local politics is kind of part of the community. The president is not. And the Correct. president can't do a whole heck of a lot for, for black communities that are going through things. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with that 100%. That's one of the reasons why I preach local government so hard right. because that's really where... The, the, the change will come if any change comes from the government at all. It's not going to be the federal. It's going to be mostly your mayor and your city council. Yeah. But even beyond that, the culture is what's going to what's going to um, to to make the determination. And that even influenced politics. You know what Andrew Breitbart said? I mean, politics mm -hmm. is downstream from culture. So let's talk about culture for a second. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about social change, and let's make it specific to the black community for just for right for for, for right now. What can be done to influence the culture in a way that does bring social change for the black community? And what specifically can, should conservatives be doing to affect that cultural change? So let me, um, you, you, you touched on, on a point I wanted to tie mm -hmm. into to, to the other question you asked me, right? I, I want to give a crystal clear example of what I mean when I say we overuse the term fix. Mm -hmm. um, by talking about different types of government policy. Yeah. So for instance, a and this this draws on a principle that I have. I call it the squire's principle because that's what people when they do social science stuff, they always name it after themselves. Yeah. But I, I call it the law of individual agency. It basically says this that the more um individual decision making that's required for a policy to be successful the less likely that it will be successful from the government's perspective. So as, as you know, the, the, whatever the policy is, if it requires people making decisions, complex decisions over a period of time, that is never going to be as successful as the government says, promises that it will or thinks that it should. So I'll give a tangible example. And, and then on the flip side is the more success relies on government control, the more successful the policy can be from the government's perspective. Mm -hmm. So here's a tangible example. If, I, if I'm the mayor of a city, I could say, I, I looked at rates of you know, obesity and diabetes and chronic ailments, and I see that they're impacting this particular community most acutely. I have instructed my administration and I'm working with the city council to build um, 20 new rec centers and, commun and fitness centers, community centers, fitness centers in all of the most affected areas. Everybody in the city would cheer. It's great because mm -hmm. the government has the resources, it has the will, if it has the coordination and the ability to administer and execute these projects, more power to them. So five years comes along and all the centers are brand new, brand spanking new equipment, so on and so on and so forth. Then another five years comes and the government measures 
chronic disease, diabetes, da 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 da, and they find that there's been marginal impact. Why? Because even for the people who go to the to the to the recreation center and the fitness center, if you don't change your eating habits, if you don't change the amount of rest that you get, um, if you go to the center but don't really exercise, you just go to play right. pinochle and hang out and you know chop it up with people. You're 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 still you're not going to be any healthier than you were before the center came there. So mm -hmm. the the government is trying to solve X, the incidence of chronic disease, but the solution that they give is Y, number of facilities built, and then they're trying to figure out why the two are not matching up. Well, those those two variables are not the same. So it's the same thing with school choice. I'm a big proponent of school choice. My wife and I we decide to homeschool our children. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a, a big proponent of school choice because I believe in um, parental authority and I believe that parents are given the, the assignment by God to educate their children, period. That's, so I start from there. The, the schools act in local parentis, right? Now the schools, right. the leftist schools think that in local parentis is Spanish for these crazy parents. So that's yeah. why they they get upset when we show up to the to the to the school boards. But it's it's a Latin term. Basically, the school is acting in the parent's stead. So okay. yeah, because the kids belong to the school and parents that's, are there to babysit. Right. They they think that we're we're allies. So again, school choice. Boom. You're in the city. They have robust charter school network vouchers, so on and so on and so forth. Those things are great, and I think children will benefit. But if you take a parent who has, let, let's say, you take two cousins. Same grandparents, similar family life. And one of them reads to his kid, he's been reading to his kid every night since child was six months old. And the other one plays music with cursing and, and, and you know, all sorts of crazy lyrics, um, has a chaotic home life. Mom and dad are always beefing in and out of the house. So on, this kid is always moving around. If somebody tells me, oh, I expect that both of these students are going to end up in the same exact place by the time they finish 12th grade, I would say on based on, on what evidence. Now, sometimes you'll get a kid who can achieve in spite of his circumstances. Yeah, yeah. But generally speaking, you, the, the, the boat is going to follow the flow of the current. And if you have one family that's dedicated to their child's education in both word and deed, and you have another in, that is chaotic and dysfunctional, so it's hard for the seeds of education to really take root. You're going to get different outcomes. So, um, so yeah. So I, I want to address. I don't want to give specific, tangible examples of what I'm yeah. talking about of where policy falls short in terms of fixing issues. Um, now, your second question. Remind me again. I'm getting a little older. Sorry. <laughs> well, so am I because I already forgot what I. <laughs> <laughs> we two old men, Jeff. Oh man, break out the walker. We, we're talking about um, policy, yeah, was, culture. Yeah, but I wanted to focus on the culture, and it's yes. specifically for the to improve conditions in the black community. Yes. As a conservative movement, what do you think are some things that we should be doing as a conservative movement, not necessarily the Republican Party, but the conservative right. movement, to affect culture in a way that helps improve con improve conditions uh, for, for black Americans who are living in areas that, that are full of, you know, poverty, crime, right. you, know, you, you already know the story. Yeah. So um, I, I think uh, there's a couple of things. One, be honest, be, be honest um, and speak loving truth. Sometimes even on the right, we get this wrong because we think truth, like the left, we think truth is just affirmation. Mm. But if, if you and I are brothers and we have a third sibling who has an intense like substance abuse problem and we're trying to plan an intervention and my response is to say, no, let's not talk about it. It's embarrassing to the family. We don't want to we don't want to make him feel bad. And your response is, if this dude doesn't get help, he's going to die in six months. And outside observe, well, according to, again, sometimes both left and right, I'm the more loving sibling. Because I'm trying to spare his feelings. Mm. When in fact, you are the more loving si sibling because you're trying to tell him a hard truth that will later lead to life. I'm trying to, to push um, 
sort of a, a, a soft lie by omission because I'm more concerned with my own reputation than, than the health of my sibling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I say that. So if I was, you know, talking about culture, again, as a black conservative, the number one drum that I would bang is the success sequence that millennials who finish school, get and hold a job, marry, and then have children, by the time they get into their 30s, have about 7% chance of living in poverty. So right. when you do four things in a particular order, you can set yourself up for um, a more productive life than when you do those things in completely out of order. I would bang that drum for as long and as hard as the good Lord gave me breath. In every, every place where you see diversity, inclusion, and equity, what I call the die agenda, every place where you see athletes kneeling, where you hear Ibram Kendi, where you hear about systemic racism, which no one defines, by the way, when you hear about structural this and intergenerational that, I would be there banging that drum all day because social change is made uh, through the purse, the pen, and the pulpit. And we've seen how leaders, whether in or outside of electoral politics, use their bully pulpits, right? Mm -hmm. Someone like Colin Kaepernick, good quarterback, he started a, a, a movement and he didn't pass any. The guy don't, said he didn't, he didn't even vote in, in the 2016 election, but he used his bully pulpit and ignited a conversation that was long overdue. And what sure. I'm saying is a black conservative, I would do the same thing, starting with the issue of family. Because to me, if, if you don't get family right, nothing else is going to matter. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the foundational building block of any civilized society. I would, I, would get, I would address the family. I would address law and peace and order. Not just law and order, but peace mm -hmm. and order. Because if you don't have order, eventually you slide into disorder. And then you have chaos. Um, I see this as a parent all the time. My wife and I will do everything we can to get the house, like people coming over, we get the house straightened up, so on and so on and so forth. And then, you know, my youngest, he'll throw some oatmeal on the floor. Okay. <laughs> we got to take him off for bath time. And then I'll see a piece of paper on the floor. And then we don't get to taking care of the laundry. And a few things start to pile up. And before you know it, it's one little thing, right? Just the oatmeal has unleashed just an entire household of chaos. Mm -hmm. Nothing is in its right place. And that's how I would define it. It's not about the people necessarily. It's the fact that everything is out of order. Mm -hmm. Families are out of order because we have um, acted as if it's the government's role to raise our children. Um, so whenever things happen, even with young people, 13-year-old kid carjack somebody, right? Yeah. First question is, is, is to the school and to the government. Another change that I would make in terms of culture is that when these things happen, and I don't care who it is, black, white, Chinese, or candy stripe, first question I ask, where's his father? Now, people will get upset at me. They will get upset at me. But I, again, I believe in order. Where is his father? Now, the answer may be his father's nowhere around. And I'll say, okay, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Because every, every, every ailment a doctor cannot fix or provide a remedy for, but he has to account for it. And in the same way, if a, if a person sprains their ankle and it goes untreated, they're going to end up having problems with their knees. They're going right. to end up having problems with their back because the rest of the body else, yeah. has, has to, has to um, uh, accommodate the original injury. And in the same way, when, when the family is out of order, again, black, white, it doesn't matter, the rest of society, civil society, um, the bureaucracy has to accommodate that. Now, my thing is, if, if my leg falls asleep, I would look like a fool if I just sat here and smacked myself in the head. Right. So you, you have to apply the, the intervention, the remedy to the part of the body that's, that's sick. And that's why, again, if you ask me about culture, family, education, 
like education excellence, not this equity nonsense, not lowering standards to make kids feel good. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves. Oh, I would take all of that stuff out of the schools mm -hmm. because, to, again, what I was talking about earlier, there were black folk coming out of the fields in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who were going to schools like the, the M Street School in DC and other schools that were quote unquote segregated. And these kids were outdoing their white counterparts at the turn of the, the 20th century. So I, I, I'm not of the opinion that black children cannot learn, obviously. Sure. But it's just learning takes discipline, hard work, dedication, and, and, a, and uh, a threefold core of committed uh, administrators and teachers, parents, and children. So I would preach education excellence wherever I go. And I, and I would reward that culturally by taking the same incentives that we give for athletics and applying them to education. Mm. I'm, not, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about, oh, yes, um, these, these silly surveys that they send out to parents. And the, the question will be, um, uh, do you think it's important for your child to get a good education? Who's going to answer no to that question? Right, right, exactly. I'm going to ask. How many hours a day does your after school does your child spend doing homework? Then you start to get some answers, right? Then you get you you get to see priorities, which I define as the observed allocation of scarce resources. So if I say education is important to my child, but I but they play football for four hours a day and then they do homework for twenty minutes, then you should know that my my uh, my words and my actions are not lining up. So family, education, peace and order. And then the last piece that I would tackle is public image. This is you and I have gone back and forth. We, we may disagree on this. Yep. Any cultural production that uh, whose whose main feature is promoting violence between black men, degradation of black women, or drug abuse for black youth gotta go sorry just gotta go because the other day i was watching some you know on pbs with my wife who was just flicking through and they were talking about you know mid 20th century and they had up some of those jim crow era posters right so you see the the black person with the dark skin and the big pink lips and the, right and the, and the minstrels and all that and when we see that when black folks see that today we have a visceral reaction Yep. Because as much as the 20th century was a fight for equal rights and equal justice, it was also a fight for the public black image. Yep. And we fought yep. that from pushing back against the birth of a nation to having, you know, uh, people like Oscar Micheaux, who, who made his own films to uplift the black image, to Ebony and Jet, to you say, OK, we can use black exploitation for a little while, but eventually that's got to go. And then we hit a period in the late no, 80s. No, no, we, we can keep Shaft. I mean. <laughs> but but we, we enjoy it in its proper proportion. And we don't, yeah. we don't make that the, the mainstream black image. Right. And, I, and again, I'm talking about people, uh, Mamie, Doctors Mamie and Kenneth Clark who did the Black Doll Experiment. I'm talking about Tom Burrell who, you know, yeah. in, in marketing and understands the power of images. But then we got to the hip hop era and we did what you and I said as writers that we try not to do. We compromised ourselves for the sake of the crowd. We said, oh, it's no longer important how the black image is maintained publicly because a small number of people are getting rich off of this and we're using this music to stick it to the man. And I thought that that was a colossal mistake. Now, if, if that type of Hip hop, which eventually came to sort of overtake and become the mainstream hip hop. Yeah, yeah. if that's if that state is a subculture like the Insane Clown Posse, or you know mm -hmm. some other stuff that people enjoy, but the the guys in the Insane Clown Posse are never going to be on MSNBC with Chris Hayes discussing you know political theory. Yeah, most people don't even know who they are. Correct, but Cardi B will get an opportunity to interview Joe Biden before he before he becomes president. So what I'm saying is our incentive structure is completely backwards. In the black community, you could be a shooter, a pimp, a hoe, a stripper, a dope boy, 
and we will give you money. We will elevate you culturally. Um, we will send you, we'll give you awards at, at BET. We'll honor you with Grammys and Oscars. You'll get to interview presidents. You'll sell products. You'll be a pitch man to white America. Um, we'll fill your pockets with millions of dollars and make you a community spokesperson. The only thing you cannot do is come out as someone whose politics are slightly right of center. Right. If you put on the red Trump hat, then you're done. Now, you can talk about shooting guys or pimping holes. You can do that. And, and we'll reward you quite right handsomely. Yeah. But if you, if you articulate uh, an originalist you know, jurisprudence like Clarence Thomas, we don't even want you in our museum. You're nothing to us. You're filth. You're worse than, than the gum on the bottom of our shoe. And what I'm saying is when you create that incentive structure for people, and, they, and obviously every, all of us know it, all of us know it. Anybody who grew up in that era, you, you hear people talk about you either got to play ball or you got to slang rock or, or, or become a, a rapper. We all know the incentive structure that's been laid down over the last 30 years and people play to it. And when you have that incentive structure, if you reward people for, for um, rapping and rhyming about killing one another, is it any surprise that in 2020, 2021, 2019, you can get from you go from city to city and you get over 150 murdered rappers. It's not a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. It's not a surprise to me. It would be a surprise if you had 150 murder gospel artists because these guys yeah. talk about God and so on and so forth. But if you or got guys hip hop, I mean, like you know, the people who get murdered, you're not surprised. But if somebody murdered, I don't know, Will Smith, that'd be a surprise because Unless he, it was Chris Rock. And he didn't do that kind of hip hop, right? Right. And then he does like to slap people, but that's a different story. Right, right. <laughs> but, still, I mean, but, I, but I get what you're saying because we have embraced a lot of that negativity. And it really, it was to make money. And of course. And to me, I, I don't necessarily have a problem. Like, say, like like when Gangster Rap first came out, mm -hmm. a lot of that was just talking about being in that life. They weren't necessarily liking it, saying it was a good thing. Fair. It was more like, you know, this is what we have to deal with. And then it kind of, you know, transformed, just like you said. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, but along with that, you, you had all these negative portrayals of black men, mm -hmm. and you didn't have enough to counteract that. Because if you look at white people, there are plenty of negative examples of white people on TV. Plenty, mm -hmm. a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But you also have a lot of positive portrayals of, of white people. So nobody's going to look at white people just in general and think that they're all a certain way. Whereas with how black people have been represented in media. I mean, and I, I, I started noticing this when I was a kid. We back then we were just portrayed as one way, and we kind of still are. I mean, I think it's gotten a little better. I mean, like mm -hmm. yeah, the Cosby Show. Forget about what Cosby did. I'm just talking about the show. Right. And then you also had other black sitcoms that had the black family being together, raising mm -hmm. the kids, and stuff like that. But I don't, I just, I don't think there was enough of that to counteract the. Um, than the, the largely negative portrayals. I mean, and it happens on right wing media, left wing media. It's not really political. It's just the the, the way it is. So yeah. I definitely see what you're saying there. But I do ag agree with the, with the cultural aspects that you listed. And to me, my problem with the right and the left mm -hmm. is that both sides, at least on the mainstream of both sides, they only tell part of the story. Because I'm you know I'm not going to discount the impact of racism historically. Or even now, I may agree or disagree with the left as to the extent to which it has an impact, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to discount it. But I'm also not going to discount what you said about the family and things like that, because I think a lot of the stuff that you said actually has more of an impact. And maybe we can talk about that at, at another time. I mean, especially when we talk about the breakdown of the black family, we think it was a government policy called welfare. Yeah, I think that played a part to me. I, I, I think feminism, the cultural impact of feminism mm, had oh, yeah. an impact on the oh, breakdown yeah. of the black family than welfare. I think that led to, to, to welfare being able to do what it did. But I think that's the problem. I mean, we can talk about racism. Yeah, we and we should deal with that. I mean, and if there is if there are government things that they're doing that are racist, we should fix that. You know, mm -hmm. gun, control, gun control is one of them. I know the left doesn't want to hear about that, but mm. see, gun control is an example of systemic racism. But that could be a totally different things. So yeah, we address that. We don't ignore it. But 
we also don't ignore what you were saying about the negative portrayals in whatever kind of music, because it ain't just hip hop, uh, you know, in the black community. It, I mean, even RMD to a certain extent has, has done some of that. There's negative aspects in all kinds of music, but even on TV or, you know, when we're talking about the family or mm -hmm. you were talking about education, mm -hmm. all of that contributes to the problem. So we got we got to fix all of that. Not the government. The government doesn't fix it. We have to fix all that. Correct. And I think that if more of us, I, I, again, I don't care who, who black people are voting for, if black people were able to talk about all of those things and focus on the areas that are actually hurting us and have more honest conversations, because you start out by saying truth. And right now, the mainstream of both sides are not telling the truth. They're just telling part of it. We need all of it. That's, yeah. that, that, that's what I would say. It doesn't disagree with what you're saying. I'm just adding on to it, really. Yeah. I mean, it all starts with the truth. And, 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 and sometimes that truth is, is, is difficult. And, and I know sometimes... It ain't right, I, I, I'll see stuff you, you know, something happen, and I'll see your post and be like, all right, Republicans, don't fall for the trap. Don't, <laughs> don't be clown yourself, right? But to be completely frank, sometimes the, the truth is going to look that way because it's, it's, it's not pretty. And, and I'm, so I'm, by nature, I'm not a, um, I like to debate, but I'm not argumentative. Right. Right. I don't have an argumentative spirit person. No, you don't. You don't. You're and I'm right. and I'm also I'm not a person. I, I I try not to ever get personal or anything like that with people, because one of my rules is, um, like if if you're the type of person that, you know, when you're a kid and you're on the playground, people say, oh, your your mom is this, and your mom is that, da 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 da, and then you say, well, your mom has a certain odor. Oh, man, how you gonna talk about my mom? I did. Uh, I'm those are the people I can't deal with. So, yeah, they can dish it out, but they can't take it. Correct, correct. Yeah. So I'm I'm totally fine dealing with people who tend to be a little bit more um, reserved and and they they don't like to argue. I'm totally fine with those people. I can deal with people who are brash and can give and take. I can't deal with the combination of those two personalities. And what happens a lot of times, particularly mm -hmm. in black spaces, is that we are real good with giving. But then when somebody offers even the slightest critique, then all oh, and people get sensitive. And, I, and that, that's the part that I, I don't. Yeah, I can't. You, you've probably seen how some of these black progressives respond to me when I call out their tap dancers. Right. No, they hate it. Like They get emotional because, no, no, we're supposed to be the tap dancers. That's that epithet is supposed to be used against us. And yeah, that there are black conservatives who are tap dancers, but there are black progressives who are tap dancers for oh, white for progressives. Sure. For sure. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not going to name names right now, but they exist. You know who they are. Right. So when I call them out, you shouldn't be so sensitive about it, but they are. They they can dish it out. But when it comes to people on their side who you know they're tap dancing, you don't want to hear it. And yeah. At this point, I just use it to entertain myself, but I am making a point. I am saying, you know, if you see tap dancing as a problem, don't just call it out on one side. Do it yeah. on all sides. So, so, so for me, the way what that looks like in terms of being honest is, I have no problem talking about if 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 people have if people want to talk about disparate incarceration rates by 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 race, mm -hmm. then they got to have the other side, which is um, dis, uh, disparate uh, criminal offending rates by race. Right. So right. I, I have no problem talking about that. I don't think that that's engaging in anti-black propaganda because again. I'm not an essentialist. I don't start from the position that people of any skin color are inherently uh, virtuous or evil on, on either side. So, so I do I do want to push back just a little bit because okay. there's a difference between the way you do it and the way okay. some of us, uh, uh, some, some of the others do it. Because the okay. thing is, I want to talk about these things. I think we should talk about higher crime rates in black communities. We have to talk about it. I just want to talk about it honestly. And I want to talk about it in a way that actually leads to something productive. That's what you do. But you know a lot of these other black conservatives, Fair. they're just trying to, you know, get those clicks. Yeah. So I so so on the other side, I understand why they get frustrated, especially even if I bring it up or if you bring it up, because they're gonna think that you're doing what the others are doing, even though you're not. Your goal Fair. isn't to demonize black people, because you don't do that. Is why I respect you, but you see this as a real problem that needs to be solved. And I wish we had more of that on our side. I, I think that's starting to happen more. I, but, I, I think so. Yeah. And, and, and the reason I do it is because, and as I said, I do it out of love because I yeah. realize that, um, and this, this goes back to culture too, in terms of one of the things that needs to be fixed. Um, when it comes to all these issues, particularly in criminal justice, 
the average black person, left and right, sees our role in that larger narrative as primarily victims of a racist criminal justice system. Mm. The truth is, the, the biggest disparities are black people as victims of violent crime. And that's why for the people who want to just sort of push that to the side, and, and the, root, the root was good for this, particularly after I left, anything that they think even has a whiff of quote unquote black on black crime, they say, oh, they're using racist talking points and this, that, that, and the next. And I'm just like, I don't care how much, how you try to butter it up, baby oil it, or, or, or tap dance around it. Mm -hmm. Homicide is the leading cause of death at about a 50% clip for black males age 15 to 24. You can't ignore um, that. You can't. Now, for, for white males of a similar age, their leading causes of death are um, uh, accidents and un unintentional, what I call the jackass phenomenon. Um, <laughs> right? So it's that. Um, so it's, it's that, and it's suicide. I can, I can say something there, but I'm not going <laughs> You know what? Um, I will because there's just some things that white folks will do that black people just would never do. Generally speaking, that this this <laughs> this is true. Generally speaking, I, I watch ridiculousness a lot, a lot, and I know the types of things that I'm gonna see black folk doing. And yeah, like, like you know who see. doesn't do that, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so 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 what I'm saying is there are different social realities, and all the people that think that it's loving again, going back to the example I gave yeah. with, with with the sibling who has a, a alcohol problem. Who think it's loving to tuck certain things under the rug because his problems make make us look bad should understand what it is that they're doing. They're engaging in self-preservation. It's a, it's about the maintenance of the black bourgeoisie mm. um, um, perception in the larger minds of white people. Because one of this is both a, a feature and a bug of general black culture, right? Mm -hmm. We don't typically do what a lot of white liberals do, which is to openly and aggressively cast off um, our, either our less fortunate, lower income, less socially refined peers and relatives. So white folks are quick, a white liberal will quick, quick, quickly tell you, especially if they're from the South or from Trump country, oh yeah, those are my, my white trash relatives. And it, mm -hmm. like they do that with the quickness. They'll throw their own family under the bus. Black folks don't tend to do that. So one effect of that is that there's a perception that the behavior of some of us impacts the image of all of us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why if we talk about rates of violent crime in some of our big cities, again, the people at the root and the griot start to get sensitive because they think, oh, you're trying to bash black people. You're doing that for white folks. And I'm like, really, it's not like it's all of us. Yeah. What, one is that. One is that. That in mm -hmm. trying to make it sound like it's all of us. The other is they think that we are trying to play to white people. And I'm like, look, the parts yeah. of Brooklyn or Philly, North Philly, West Philly, that I'm talking about, white people don't live there. They, they, they are not the victims of these crimes. It is, it is black um, toddlers, elementary school age kids. I mean, there is an order of magnitude more black K through 12 students who are shot and killed in crossfire and drive-bys mm -hmm. every year in this country than, than black men who are shot while unarmed by the police, shot and killed unarmed by the police, mm -hmm. order of magnitude more. Anybody, you and I both, you know, we follow, you know, Leonidas Johnson, he puts together this list. Yeah. Like that, running that, tally. Yeah. Right. It's heartbreaking. So for me, I, I don't care what white people think about it because th their feelings are not the issue. The issue is, are we willing, the same people that says, that say America needs to own up to its history and be honest about its history, mm. don't want to be honest about our present. Mm. So we demand that white people take more responsibility for the actions of their ancestors than we do the actions of our sons. That's unsustainable. So my thing is this, it's not, it's not about trying to make some people feel comfortable. It's just like, look, yeah. we, we live in these neighborhoods. Yeah. And if we're not willing to address it, then all it's going to do is get more chaotic. And you know exactly how this is going to go. The black middle class people who have intact families and stable employment and good wages are going to take their money, walk it right up out of the city center 
and go and move in the suburbs. They're yep. going to leave Brooklyn and go and live in, in uh, Secaucus, New Jersey. They're going to leave D.C. They're going to go to Montgomery County and Prince George's County, Maryland. And same thing for wherever you know urban center you are. The black folk who have the resources are going to leave eventually. And then it's just going to be the low income and the poor black folk who are left there to suffer. Mm-hmm. And we're going to think, oh, I did my part because I made some guilty white girl at, at um, Orange Theory or my Peloton class say that black lives matter. And I'm just not interested. Yeah. In that. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, you made a lot of good points. I wish I had more time because there's yeah. just so much there. We we have to do this again. because Yeah, we, we are part two. But like, I mean, like we got to. I don't know. I feel like we've already gone deep, but there's so much in what we've been talking about mm. that I really would like to unpack more. Okay. So maybe sometime soon we can do this again because okay. I think we need more of these conversations. For sure. But um, but before we cut out, um, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Sure. Um, people can follow me on Twitter at Delano Squires, D-E-L-A-N-O-S-Q-U-I-R-E-S. Um, same handle on Instagram, but I, I tend to do most of my troublemaking on Twitter. And then um, I write twice a week for The Blaze, typically Tuesday and Friday, and appear twice a week on Fearless with Jason Whitlock, again, typically Tuesday and Friday. So you all can follow me there and interact with me. I, I you know, love to, to have a nice dialogue and exchange of ideas. And, and yeah, that's where people can find me. Yeah, and by the way, I, I don't appreciate you moving in my on my black conservative troll thing <laughs> I got going on. That's supposed to be me, me and I, I see you. I see what you're doing out there. Now you you got that, Jeff. You got that. You got that. That's your space. All right, just yeah. just so you know. So you, <laughs> I start seeing you put breaking in front of a tweet. Oh no 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 no, yeah. no, no, no on no, site. No. You know? <laughs> see, that's a black and black crime root. That's the yeah, yeah side, I'm I'm black and black crime. Yes. <laughs> All right, then I'll see you next time, bro. All right, thank you, man. Appreciate it.